Welcome back everyone to lecture eight on a lecture series in molecular simulations and statistical mechanics. Um, last time we gave an introduction, an introduction uh, we introduced thermodynamics uh, from this sort of postulate approach by taking uh, some things for granted like the existence of this entropy function that gets maximized at equilibrium. And this time we're going to look at some of the consequences of these postulates, specifically something referred to as a fundamental relation. And what we'll find is that from these fundamental relations, we're going to be able to derive your more familiar equations of state, but in a slightly more general way. So to begin, let's discuss fundamental relations. So a fundamental relation is an equation or a function which completely describes the thermodynamic properties of a system. And to this point, we've discussed entropy, this S function, which is a function of the internal energy, the volume, and the numbers of all the particles. And this, we actually know, is a fundamental relation. So we're saying this is a fundamental relation. Now, of course, from our postulates last time, we learned that we could invert this function with respect to the internal energy, and we could write the internal energy as a function of S, V, and N. And this is also a fundamental relation. So this is also a fundamental relation. So let's think and examine this fundamental relation a little further, specifically in this en uh, internal energy case. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the first differential of this. So how do we compute the first differential? We've done this before, right? We say the first differential du, a change in u, is related to the change in all of the parameters. Now, of course, if s changes, right? If u changes, s could change. So we need to use a chain rule here. So a change in u is associated with the partial derivative of u with respect to s. And of course, this is at constant volume and number of particles, so keeping these constant times how much s changes, right? And then, of course, we have terms like this for each of our variables. So now we'll have partial u, partial v, dv. And this is at constant u and number of particles. And then in our final term, we're going to have this sum over from i equal 1 to n, where n is the number of particles in the system, or a number of unique species in the system, not to be confused with number of particles, as we had in our classical mechanics cases. And this, of course, is going to be the partial u partial n i at constant Oh, and it looks like I accidentally wrote internal energy at constant entropy and volume, D and I. So for now, let's look at this equation. And I'm going to, before we sort of motivate these physically, I'm going to introduce you to some definitions. So partial U, partial S, this term is defined as the temperature. So what we're going to have now is that du is equal to T, the temperature, times ds, plus this term is defined as the negative pressure, minus P dV. This term is defined as the chemical potential of species I plus the sum from i equal 1 to n of mu i d n i. This is probably what you're familiar with from your other thermodynamics classes. The change in internal energy is related to TDS minus PDV plus mu d n. So you can see that simply by writing out the first differential of the internal energy 
and thinking about it as this fundamental relation of these, of these variables, we can actually just get directly to this result that you probably were taught without, a, without any direct introduction. Let's look back at what we talked about in the first lecture, where we said that the change in internal energy was equal to d bar w, so the mechanical work, the change in mechanical work, and d bar q. Well, we saw that d bar w was equal to minus p dv, right? dq we're going to keep. And in our previous argument, we didn't have chemical potential as the number of particles. But what we're going to write now is that technically we should have this additional term. And this is going to be written as dwc. And this is going to be known as the quasi-static chemical work. So this is work due to the, chemi uh, the chemical interactions, quasi-static chemical work, dwc. So we're going to have this here. Now in our last expression, we had the following. We had that du is equal to, I'm going to just rearrange terms here, minus PDV plus TDS plus the sum over all of the unique species of mu i dNi. So it's not immediately obvious which one of these fits with, uh, with, with the other one, but we can start to make it a good inference here that this differential change in work due to heat is related to this TDS term. And this differential quasi-static chemical work is related to this chemical potential term. And so we can sort of see how in our initial development of the first law of thermodynamics, just keeping track of the different types of energy in the system, and then also writing a fundamental relation, we can actually start to put some physical quantities uh, to this equation. Now, let's think about exactly what these quantities, pressure, temperature, and chemical potential, are. Well, first, let's write down the definitions. Minus P was defined as partial U, partial V at constant S and N. T was defined as, and I guess I'll put these dots to indicate that it's defined, partial U, partial S at constant V in number of particles. And mu I was defined as partial U, partial Ni at constant entropy and volume. So let's write the dependencies of these, um, of these variables. Let's write in, explicitly in the same way that we wrote U. So we have P now is a function of SV and Ni, right? Same with T. And same with mu, mu i is equal to mu i of SV and Ni. So by taking the derivative, we haven't changed the dependencies. This should make some sense. Now what's interesting is when we start to think about what these quantities represent. Recall that these quantities here, the entropy, volume, number of particles, and U, were extensive parameters. That meant, and we described this last time, that meant they depended on the size of the system. So we have U, S, V, N. These were extensive parameters. What that meant in the, last uh, in the last time is that if you took any of these variables, we'll just take U as an example, and you multiplied by some number on each of their arguments, so some number lambda, let's say, 
that this was equal to lambda times u as if you never multiplied by those arguments. This was a property of extensivity. Just erase that here. But what about these variables? Does, if you double the size of your system, does the temperature change by twice as much? A way to think about it is if I had two rooms and they were both at 50 degrees uh, Celsius, or Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and you opened a door between them, would the temperature all of a sudden change? Our intuition tells us probably not. We need a difference in temperature in order for the temperature in the rooms once they mix to become something new, right? So what that means is that by doubling the size of the system, you're not going to have this extensive property. It, this is also going to hold for the pressure and the temperature as well. So these parameters are what we call intensive. Intensive. This means they do not depend on how big the system is. These are things like temperature, pressure, chemical potential of species I. Now we can express this if we take something like T, for instance, and we multiply all of its arguments, so its SV and NI arguments, by a number lambda, it equals, by changing the size of the system, it doesn't change the temperature, so it just equals T time, or T of SV and NI. So by multiplying the arguments by some number, you just recover the original T as if you never multiplied by those arguments. So you can really interpret this physically, is that the temperature of two systems is not additive. And we're going to show this uh, in an explicit example, but for now, let's just keep our intuitions intact here. If I, you know, like I said, if I open a door between two rooms of equal temperature, their temperature won't change. This is all this is saying, but in a, mathematical, uh, a mathematically precise form. Now, what are these called? These intensive variables written as functions of extensive variables. So here I have pressure written. Well, these equations are known as equations of state. And of course, you've probably heard of and used the classic uh, um, ideal gas equation of state, right? So the ideal gas has an equation of state of PV equal nRT, right? So now, of course, in this equation, right, we have an extensive parameter, we have our intensive parameter, and we've rewritten some of the parameters in terms of other intensive parameters. But this is still a valid equation of state. More generally, they're going to be, uh, equations of state are going to be intensive parameters as functions of extensive parameters. So now we're going to go on to a new concept called the Euler form. The Euler form. So let's recall this property of our extensive parameters, where if we multiply every argument by a number, oh, that we get that argument times that number as if you never multiplied its arguments, right? All right, let's try something interesting. Let's differentiate with respect to lambda, okay? So let's take the partial derivative of both sides with respect to this parameter we've introduced. Well, this side is easy, right? Because u s v of n i is just a constant to lambda here. So this derivative, we just take this lambda away, and we're left with, I'm going to just write this one here. We're left with u of s v and n i. How about this guy? 
Well, this one's a little different. We need to use the chain rule like we did before. And I'm going to switch colors here. So we're going to look at this guy. So we're going to use the chain rule, right? So we're going to end up with partial u, partial lambda. And actually, our lambda is paired with an s here. So we can write partial lambda s, right? And this is going to be at constant v and n. And then we multiply that by the derivative of this guy with respect to lambda. So the derivative of that guy with respect to lambda, we can just write for now, we'll say partial gamma s or lambda s partial lambda. And then, of course, we need to do this for every single term. So partial u partial lambda p at constant entropy in ni times partial lambda uh, v partial lambda plus the sum from i equal 1 to n, all of the partic uh, unique particles in the system, of partial u partial lambda ni partial lambda ni constant uh, entropy and volume partial lambda. Now, did we make any assumptions about what lambda was? We didn't, right? So this should be true for any lambda that's, that's real, I think. Well, we haven't talked about complex numbers. But for any real lambda, this holds. Well, let's take a particular case. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to call it 1, and I'm going to move it up here. Well, what if lambda is just 1? Let's just make lambda equal to 1, right? What happens? Well, if lambda is 1, then this first term is just partial u partial s at constant volume and number of particles, which was just temperature, right, by definition. So we have u equals t. Now we have s is constant with respect to this lambda derivative here, right? So we can pull the s out like that. This derivative is now just 1. So this is ts, right? Same here with this lambda being 1. Partial u, oh, and this isn't partial p, right? This is partial v. I wrote it incorrectly there. This was minus pressure. The v can get pulled out. This derivative is 1. Ts minus pv, right? And then, of course, we have our sum from i equal 1 to n of now mu i ni. So this looks a little different than our differential form. It's similar, but now we don't have the, you know, before we had ds dv, right? Now these are gone. This is known as the Euler form. So we're going to write this is the Euler form. That's just its name. But you can see how we get there. We look at this property of the extensive parameters. We take a clever uh, derivative, and we can pop out this, uh, this interesting form of the equation. Now, what can we do with this? Well, what this is going to allow us to do is start to look at some really interesting relationships between these variables. All right, let's write out the Euler form. u is equal to ts minus pv plus the sum from i equal 1 to n of mu i n i. All right, well, let's calculate du. The change in u. Well, the change in u now, we have products, so we need to use the product rule, is going to be t ds, the change in s, plus s dt. And of course, we have this for the other terms minus p dv minus v dp. 
And finally, sum from i equal 1 to n of mu i d n i. And then, of course, we have the other term plus n i d mu i, right? But remember, from our fundamental equation, we had another form, right? When we looked at, with, when we looked at this uh, change in u from our fundamental equation, we found this. We found that du is tds minus pdv plus the sum. And I'm writing it spread out like this to show you the like terms here. So if you've already figured out what, what's happening, So this was our fundamental equation approach, right? So there's terms missing here. The Euler form gives us these extra terms. But we know that this fundamental equation is correct according to our postulates, or I guess we've postulated that it's correct, right? Well, based on this, what does that mean? Let's just subtract these two equations from each other. What we're going to get is that 0 equals so du minus, so this is like minus 0, sdt minus vdp plus the sum of all the, over all the unique chemical species of ni d mu i. So this must equal 0. This is a constraint on the system. This constraint is known as the gibbs duhem relation. So this is the gibbs duhem relation. This is actually used in molecular simulation techniques um, in order to help make sure your thermodynamics makes sense. Um, but you can see, basically, it, all it is is looking at the Euler form, seeing what's left over, compared to the uh, fundamental equation form and saying this also must be true according to what we know about the thermodynamics. So what can we do with the gibbs duhem relation? So one thing that we can come up with is actually the pretty famous Gibbs phase rule. And right now, we're going to rely on our intuition a little bit, because we haven't gone through explicit uh, proofs that how the intensive parameters behave is exactly how I'm saying they behave. But let's say we have some interface between coexisting phases. For instance, let's say we have a solid coexisting with a liquid. Right? So you have some phase equilibrium going on. Now, we can think about this system. If left for a long time, right, we've sort of come up with the intuition that at equilibrium, its temperature will be equilibrated, and its pressure, and its chemical potential as well. So at equilibrium, T, P, and mu are equal between phases. And we haven't explicitly shown this yet. We will, but for now, if we take this to be true, you're going to see something really cool come out of this. So this is the case, right? And let's say in general, so you know, we have a solid liquid here, but in general, there could be m phases, we'll say, as many phases as you want, right? If you take this as being true, then that means the temperatures are equal across all m phases. Same with the pressures and same with the chemical potentials. Uh, is equal to PM. Mu1 is equal to V. So there's this coexistence. Now let's say we perturb the state of the system by increasing the temperature by some T. Right? So we're going to just increase this temperature. And we're going to say that that increase in temperature is by a dt. 
So the system, we're going to take the system and increase its temperature by dt. Well, now we need to realize that in order for these m phases to stay in equilibrium, these other properties need to adjust all simultaneously. So really what we're going to end up with when we just change the temperature is something where once we've equilibrated again, we have T1 plus DT is equal to all of the different subphases TM plus DT. And the same is going to be true of the pressure, but now there's some change in pressure that's associated with this change in temperature. And the chemical potential. There's going to be some change in the chemical potentials of each species. It's equal to d or uh, mu m plus d mu m, right? And these technically should have these different uh, sub subscripts as well, because. In general, we need, we need to be very general here, right? OK, well, if this is true, if T1 equals T2 equals Tm, if P1 equals P2 equals Pm, mu1, mu2 equals mu n, then these, this system of equations can be reduced down, because we can just subtract all of these absolute initial conditions out. And we find that dt1 is equal to all of the dt's. So it's equal to dtm. The dp1 is equal to all of the uh, changes in pressure. The changes in the chemical potential of one are equal to the changes in chemical potentials of all others. Right? But we just learned from the gibbs duhem relation a relationship regarding these types of quantities, right? So we know from Gibbs Duhem, I'll switch to a different color here, that zero equals SDT minus VDP plus the sum of the Ni d mu i's. And this must be true for all of the phases. For all the phases, right? OK, so we've invoked our gibbs duhem relation. I'm going to keep this guy because we got this from looking from comparing this and this and what I'm going to do is erase here so now we have Gibbs Duhem relations on every phase and I'm going to specify the phase by putting a let's see what notation I like here putting a little j so the j phase j is going to index from 1 to the number of phases m dt minus v of j dp plus sum to n of ni of j, how many particles of each composition are in phase j, d mu i. Now let's say, let's hold pressure constant. If we hold pressure constant, dp is 0, so this term goes away. And we're left with just s of j dt plus the sum ni equal 1 ni of j d mu i. And this, of course, equals 0. Now this is kind of a mysterious equation. In order for this to always be equal to zero, that means that if I change dt, right, there has to be an associated change in d mu i. 
but these are always non-zero quantities, right? So the only way for this to be true is if dt and d mu themselves are zero. So dt must equal d mu i, which must equal zero. But we know that that isn't true, right? We know that there is a change in dt in the system, right? Assuming we held the pressure constant. So what we have here is a contradiction. We draw that usually as two swords crossing each other. We, we're contradicting ourselves by saying that we need to hold the pressure constant, right? So that means we can't maintain phase coexistence if we hold the pressure constant and change the other two. We can't maintain phase coexistence if we hold pressure constant while changing T and mu. Well, what does that mean? I've just erased some of the boards so that I had a bit more space here, right? So we've just contradicted ourselves saying, we can't maintain the phase coexistence if we hold the pressure constant while changing t and mu. And specifically, we should say mu i, right? So we need to change them all together. Well, how many independent variables is that? Well, we have t, p, and we have n mu i's. n, and this, this actually might be confusing to write this way. We have all these mu i's, right, where i ranges from 1 to the number of unique, uh, a unique constituents in, this, in the system, right? Well, how many is that? Well, that's n, the total number, plus 2, right? Now, from the Gibbs uh, Duhem relation up here, how many equations do we have? We have m equations, right? We have m equations and n plus 2 unknowns, right? How do we make sure the system has solutions? To ensure solutions to this equation, to ensure solutions to Gibbs Duhem, we can only vary n plus 2 minus m parameters independently. We can only specify n plus 2 minus m of the variables independently. Independently. Because imagine if we varied more of these independently, right? We would end up with more variables than equations. If you have more variables to specify than equations, then you're in an underdefined system and you can't actually figure, what, figure out what's going on, right? So we can only specify up to this many. This is called the Gibbs phase rule. This is the Gibbs phase rule. And really all it says is that for the number of chemical species, so number of chemical species, plus 2 minus the number of phases, this is the number of variables that you can vary independently in a thermodynamic system. So let's just do a quick example. Let's say we have a liquid which is coexisting with a solid, and let's say, let's say it's liquid water and solid water. Oh, that doesn't work because I put the solid on the bottom. So let's, let's try something else. Uh, it's just some liquid, some solid, and there's a solvent or a solute in here, some particles of another species, right? They're dissolved in this, and these are 
particles coming from the solid. So maybe this is something like a system where you have a pile of salt of NaCl and water and you have some salt that's dissolved up into the water and some that's remained a solid. Well, how many variables can we vary independently according to the Gibbs phase rule? Well, how many number of chemical species do we have? We have NaCl, right? These are, we could say these are independent, right? Na and Cl, so we have Na plus Cl plus H2O. So that gives us three species plus two minus the number of phases. Well, there's a solid and a liquid phase, right? Minus the number of phases, which is two. So we can only vary three of these parameters independently. We can only vary three of the T, P, the mu of water, the mu of chlorine, and the mu of Na+. So that's it for today. Um, we found that by looking at fundamental equations uh, in this pretty simple mathematical approach, we're able to derive really cool things like the Euler form, uh, things like the gibbs duhem relation, which provide constraints on how our thermodynamic systems can behave, and from that derive some very classic results like the Gibbs phase rule. So thank you guys very much. Uh, we're getting close to wrapping up the thermodynamics that we're gonna need uh, to do molecular simulations and statistical mechanics. So I think we have two lectures left of that and then we'll be moving on to StatMech. So thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you next time.